All right, hello, and thank you for joining us today. We are so thrilled to continue the historic Artist Homes and Studios virtual road trip for its second season. We have a very special series of presentations planned for you over the coming months with six participating artist home sites, including the Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens, which is our second stop on this year's virtual road trip. So the Historic Artist Homes uh, and Studios Virtual Road Trip is a collaboration between the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, and the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program, also referred to as HAWS. For those of you just learning about HAWS, this is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation and is currently a coalition of over 55 museums that were previously homes and working studios of many American artists. Through its support and advocacy, Haas is helping preserve the nation's legacy of creativity in the visual arts. We launched this program last year uh, in response to the recently published Guide to Historic Artist Homes and Studios written by Valerie Belent, a copy right here, beautiful book. Um, Valerie is the program manager of Haas. Uh, as we were all looking out our windows over the last few years, just longing for an escape to new and unfamiliar places, Valerie's book provided us with a perfect jumping off place for an adventure. Uh, this virtual road trip became the next best thing. So on this year's virtual road trip, we are traveling across the United States east to west, venturing deep into the museums, homes, and preserved spaces that nurtured the creation of thousands of artworks. Along the way, we'll talk with directors, curators, collection managers, and artists to learn more about the incredible stories told at each of these sites. So my name is Mackenzie Dunstan, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the James Castle House in Boise, located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people. The James Castle House uh, has been a member of Haas since 2019, and as your unofficial uh, stop on this virtual road trip, I would encourage you to learn more about our museum here in Boise. Uh, with me today is Valerie Belent, the program manager of Haas, along with Margaret Horgan, the managing director of the Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens, and Frances Fisher, who's the gardens board chairwoman. Lavona Andrew will be providing ASL interpretation today. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. So we are committed to making this program accessible and are integrating accessibility through American Sign Language Interpretation and English Language Captions. Captions are available by clicking on the Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting Show Subtitle. We strongly encourage your questions throughout this presentation. Uh, you can send your questions to us through the Q&A box. Uh, this event is also being recorded and will be made available online in the coming weeks. Uh, you can find this and other recordings from the Haas Virtual Road Trip on the James Castle House YouTube channel. And at the end of this presentation, uh, we will also add some uh, additional links to upcoming road trip events, uh, website and mailing lists, and additional contact information. So because this is a virtual road trip, um, I'd like to set the stage a little bit and offer a few travel notes for us to consider before we get started. So last month we visited the Wharton Eshrick Museum in Malvern, Pennsylvania, which leaves a lot of tarmac uh, between Malvern and the Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, so with so much to see over this roughly 1200 mile drive, uh, you would wanna plan at least three days, if not five, uh, for this trip in real life. Uh, as we head south to Florida, we're actually gonna give Baltimore and Washington DC um, a wide berth and instead follow a more scenic route down Interstate 81 through Virginia. In Virginia, um, we, it, you might consider on this road trip, uh, stretching your legs by venturing underground into the extraordinary geology, uh, geology and crystalline formations found in the Shenandoah Caverns. Uh, but if caves don't really do it for you, um, maybe you'll head a few more hours south to summer, summon your inner pinball wizard at the Roanoke Pinball Museum. This museum is home to over 50 vintage pinball machines uh, where every exhibit is playable in a fully hands-on museum experience. From there, we're gonna cross into North Carolina um, where we'll get to enjoy some outdoor recreation at Lake Norman. 
Located just outside the city of Charlotte, this large man-made lake is great for all kinds of outdoor activity, including hiking, biking, fishing, boating, and more. Um, perhaps after spending a few days lakeside, taking a break from being in the car, we'll head to Savannah, Georgia. In Savannah, uh, you could catch a midday matinee at the Lucas Theater for the Arts, which is a really remarkable 1920s movie palace. Uh, while you're there, you could grab a crepe, coffee, or tea at the theater's cafe, Vedette. And just a few blocks away, um, strolling around the Paris market is something you can't miss, where you'll find all sorts of old world inspired treasures. Remember, it wouldn't be a road trip without collecting a few souvenirs along the way. Next, we'll make our way into Florida, stopping briefly in St. Augustine to wander the Villa Zareda Museum. Uh, this was built in 1883, and the design of this home turned museum was heavily inspired by 12th century Moorish and Spanish architecture. Um, it is home to a massive collection of antiques, um, including what is believed to be the oldest rug in the world called the Sacred Cat Rug. So finally, um, after that brief stop, um, we will head toward our destination, uh, the tropical sanctuary that is the Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens. So now that we um, have arrived, finally, after this long journey in uh, West Palm Beach, I would like to invite Valerie um, to share with her her experiences both visiting this city uh, and the Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens. Valerie, take it away. Thank you, Mackenzie, to you and everyone involved at the James Castle House for spearheading this virtual road trip in collaboration with Historic Artists Homes and Studios. I'm excited uh, to have us continue this year's series with another artist whose talents extended to so many different forms of art making, all culminating in the total work of art that is this property. For many, this presentation will be your very first introduction to the numerous talents and accomplishments of Anne Norton, but I urge you, please don't let it be your last. I had the pleasure of making my first visit here just a little over a month ago. It is really hard for me to put into words the childlike wonder I felt when I first stepped into it, a sight I felt I actually already knew, but I had no idea. There is majesty and intimacy here in rare balance, sunlit splendor and dark secret loamy nooks coexist in this magical place that Ann Norton created in ways that really only an artist can achieve. On my trip here, I knew one of the first places I needed to visit was the Norton Museum of Art, which is part of Ann's own origin story in West Palm Beach. Here she came to teach as a young artist at the museum school, befriending founders Elizabeth Calhoun Norton and Ralph Hubbard Norton, who would later become her husband after Elizabeth's death. The works Elizabeth and Ralph gave to the museum still form the core of this collection, which has since grown to more than 8,000 works of art. Upon his own death, an endowment provided the ability for the museum to purchase additional works, and bequests came from his personal collection, such as the draped figure by Ann Norton um, towards the right of your screen. Today, the museum also hosts strong uh, rotating exhibitions, including an annual show focused exclusively on women artists. Certainly, great arts and culture await you here, but this is a city after all, and there is a vibrant nightlife and food culture and a chance to see, for Northeastern at least, this is a tree, palm trees decked out with twinkle lights and not only during the holidays. There are many popular food and architecture tours available and even a scavenger hunt tour. You can spend hours at Rosemary Square, which you see at the bottom of your screen, a Mediterranean themed retail and entertainment center, consistently rated as one of the top things to do in all of South Florida. There are numerous public beaches, which will ensure you will get your fill of Florida sunshine or take advantage of watercraft excursions from airboat rides to catamaran rentals to sunset cruises and fishing charters. There are also plenty of places to snorkel and enjoy the magic that awaits below the water surface. Ways to engage with wildlife abound, both inside and nearby the city, even if you really don't want to get up and close and personal underwater. Stand on the dock and see pods of sea cows drawn by the warm water overflow of the Florida Power and Light Facility. 
gentle and friendly creatures. They may even let you pat their bellies while you stand dockside. Manatee Lagoon's Discovery Center even features a manatee live webcam. Perhaps more unexpected is the ability to drive through a 600 acre safari park established in 1967, where visitors can view zebras, giraffes, and lions, along with many other species, most wandering in a cageless environment, all a short drive from downtown. Just 10 minutes south of urban West Palm Beach, you can have an even rarer experience at Panther Ridge, the brainchild of Julie Behrens, who still runs it, begun in the 90s when people started bringing big cats they no longer wanted or could care for. Today in this sanctuary, a mix of tigers, rare black panthers, jaguars, mountain lions, and cheetahs roam freely in habitats created to emulate their native um, environs. But what if you're looking for a more authentic Florida wilderness? Nearby is the National Wildlife Reserve, we're here on the northern fringes of the Everglades. You can see endangered species such as the wood, sto wood stork, as well as the king of Florida wildlife, the American alligator. You can look down from an observation tower, up from a canoe, or walk on elevated boardwalks through tropical landscapes, which evoke for me um, part of that tropical experience um, that I got at Ann Morton Sculpture Gardens. Um, what if you prefer more human-focused attractions? Cross over to Palm Beach Island and stroll around the charming shops, restaurants, and palm-laden courtyards on Worth Avenue. Meander down towards the water by Old Ocean Boulevard to take in the majestic clock tower, a favored selfie spot for locals and for tourists. Well, wistfully, I think by now, thinking of a Grace Kelly moment with Hermes scarf-covered hair, Chanel black movie star sunglasses, cruising waterside with the top down, but maybe you perhaps forgot your convertible. No problem, cross back over to West Palm Beach and visit one of the newest and most popular attractions, Ragtop's Auto Museum, where you can get your fix of classic car culture and glamour, or take a in a polo match at the International Polo Club, one of the sport's most famous and impressive venues, seasonal uh, matches are actually often open to the public. But of course, one of the joys of traveling to this part of Florida is the chance to marvel at the mix of fantastic Gilded Age, Mediterranean, and Spanish colonial revival architecture that is literally everywhere. The 100,000 square foot winter home of Henry Flagler, one of the founders of Standard Oil, built as a wedding present for his third wife is one of the most impressive examples, now open as a museum. Created to rival the Beaux-Arts mansions of Newport, Rhode Island, Whitehall was hailed at the time it was opened to the New York, by the New York Herald as more wonderful than any palace in Europe and more magnificent than any other private dwelling in the world. Stylistic influences range from Louis XIV to Swiss chalet. One can also see one of the private rail cars the Flaglers use to make their annual trip south. Looking for a total multidisciplinary immersion into the arts in a spectacular setting, look no farther than the Society of the Four Arts where you can take in a lecture or a performance and view world-class art both inside at rotating exhibitions and outside from such varied offerings as a cast of Gilded Age sculptor, Augustus St. Gaudens Diana, which you see on screen, to organic forms by class master, glass master Chihuly, set amidst the fragrant blooms in their exquisite gardens. The literary arts are also well represented at this cultural institution founded in 1936, which boasts not only impressive library for adults, but also a children's library. So now you perhaps want to personally channel some of that old Palm Beach glamour after visiting all these spectacular artistic settings. A short way from shopping on Worth Avenue is the opulent Brazilian Hotel, which originally opened its doors on New Year's Eve in 1926. Stay over in the boutique hotel, pamper yourself in the spa, or have a lovely breakfast as I did in the dining room. Grits and avocado toast are both on this menu. 
see and be seen while sipping mixologist creations in one of the retro banquettes or vanish instead into the seclusion and tranquility of the palm fringed courtyard for lunch. Other artistic wonders await if you choose to venture a bit farther afield. Two and a half hours north, not far from Orlando, is the retirement home designed by figurative sculptor Alvin Polashek in Winter Park, Florida, now a Haas site. Tour the lakeside gardens featuring sculpted works such as the Thower, which you see on screen, an, ideal, an idealized male figure sowing the seeds of his own destiny, um, a personal credo of this Czech immigrant artist or take a two hour excursion south of Palm Beach to Miami, to Vizcaya, the former villa and estate of industrialist James Deering. That's Deering painted by John Singer Sargent at the bottom of your screen. This bayfront Renaissance inspired home bordered by mangroves and rocky shoreline offers 10 acres of formal gardens and 32 decorated rooms, many with murals and other artworks commissioned specifically for this property. You can journey via car, of course, or perhaps take a ride on the newly established Bright Line, the high-speed rail line running to points north and south of West Palm Beach. Back in West Palm Beach, complement your visits to old school landmarks by treating yourself to some of the new places that are making a mark in this town. Shop for gifts, chic home goods, or for yourself at the Hive Boutiques, outfitting yourself in distinctly Palm Beach style, and then you will be all set to taste the delights of the Hive Cafe and Bakery, where I enjoyed an amazing lunch, fine wine, and of course, oodles of sweet confections. Too many, perhaps, that were good for me. But among all these worthy pursuits, a visit to the Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens is unique. Here, art, architecture, and nature all come together to the creative vision of one artist. The essence of process is everywhere here, felt from the grand scale of monumental brickworks down to the magic of the small bottles of compounds used to create surfaces on bronze, very rare and seldom preserved. Here you can witness the overlapping layers of a life and creative practice that evolved over many decades culminating in the vision of a landscape that could provide respite and retreat for community and perpetuity. The power of this place is palpable when you visit. My own trip to the site was the first travel I had taken since the pandemic. And at times, may I say, re-entry was a bit overwhelming, but I was able to find private places within the garden to rebuke and to be solitary and to contemplate until I was ready to re-engage. And I was grateful for that, but I also understood that this was exactly what Ann Norton had sought to create here. You will learn more about her inspiring story in this amazing place from Tu and the Haas family I have come to know very well. Thank you, Margaret Horgan and Francis Fisher for sharing this site with us today and to you, Mackenzie, as we set off on this journey. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, I definitely want to go on vacation to Florida with you at some point. It would be so fun. All the adventures. Um, well, I'm going to now pass it off to Margaret and Francis uh, to, of course, get to the meat of today's presentation uh, to talk more about Ann Norton and her incredible home, studio, and garden. Thank you, Mackenzie. We're so thrilled to be with you. We, we thank the James Castle House and certainly Valerie Ballant. She is a wonderful friend to this organization and we're so honored to be a part of the Historic Artists Homes and Studios program. Um, today is so exciting for us because we get to tell the fairy tale story that is actually the real life legacy and love letter to this community from Ann Weaver Norton. I am in uh, her studio, which was a wedding gift from her husband, Ralph Norton, in 1948, designed by prominent Florida architect, uh, Marion Sims Wyeth. And there are two uh, prominent architects associated with this property. Um, also, Marion Sims Wyeth, who designed the Norton House in 1925, 
and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. We love this place for so many reasons and where I am right now really captures the spirit of Ann Norton as an artist. Um, the magic she created throughout this two acre sanctuary of rare palms and cycads and native plants here. As Valerie said, it's truly an experience and meant to be very mysteriously discovered um, as you wander the property and find uh, what a four foot nine petite Southern artist created in terms of monumental sculptures around every turn. Um, the majority of those are built in brick. And I'm gonna take you back to uh, Ann Norton's roots. If you really want to know what inspired her, you must know uh, where she spent her childhood, um, how her vision for art and gardens in an outdoor setting which is now a, an urban preserve. As you saw from Valerie's presentation, we are in the most explosive time of growth and development in South Florida. So Ann Norton truly had the vision and forethought to designate a property as her legacy to this community. She was um, an architect, an artist, and of course turned preservationist when she um, left this to our community and visitors. And we believe it's special for so many reasons. Um, this is a part of something so unique among the cultural uh, institutions represented here. And Anne and Ralph Norton um, were true pioneers uh, of culture in South Florida and in this country. So we're going to look forward to telling you this story. And I have um, a great personal connection to Ann Norton, which makes um, my association with Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens very special. Um, Ann Norton, Ann Weaver, grew up in Selma, Alabama and I grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. They are a stone's throw away from one another, um, connected by uh, tributaries of, of the Mississippi. Uh, the Black Warrior River runs through Tuscaloosa and connects to the Cahaba River in Selma. And they call that part of uh, Alabama the Black Belt because it has such rich, fertile soil. And one of the historic facts that I love is uh, on the banks of the Cahaba there around Selma uh, was the first meeting of Chief Tuscaloosa, uh, head of the Choctaws that were the predominant Native American tribe in that area, um, meeting with Hernando de Soto. So that predates Ann Norton's time, but that black belt is part of the source of wealth for uh, the family she uh, was brought up with uh, in, in Selma. Um, and, and that came from cotton growing. And so you'll hear just a little bit today. I know you just saw uh, photos of Ann with her big bow and her hair. And that was probably about as um, extroverted as she was uh, during her life. Uh, we can go on now to, I think our slide of beginning her life. She, she really became a trilogy of artists. And here you see uh, two of her aunts. You see Clara, Weaver Parrish and Rose Pettish Weaver, and then her mother Edith um, there on, on the right. Um, Clara, she was a painter and an illustrator. She studied at the Art Students League in, in New York City under William Merrick Chase. She exhibited at the Paris Exposition in 1900 and was a stained glass designer for Louis Comfort Tiffany. 
She later returned to Alabama, organizing exhibitions of Southern women artists. And Rose Weaver studied in New York as well and had a career as a sculptor in wood. So art was a way of life among the, the family and strong women were their calling card. Um, Anne began her life as an artist at the age of five. And you can see her home there in Selma on the left and the Weaver family on their porch on the right. Um, we like to say that uh, she used her, her dog, uh, Potsy's dog house as her first gallery and studio and really took pride in displaying her early drawings um, there in, in the dog's house with the friends that she grew up with um, on that plantation. So this had a big influence on Ann Norton's artistic development, um, this environment, this place in, in Selma. And there's Poxy and Ann and her father. Um, she began to visualize what is represented here um, in her childhood. And the studio I sit in now, there, when I talk about Native Americans, um, she did all of, all of her work, the evolution of her big gateway brick sculptures um, in cedar. She took a lot of inspiration from Native Americans and particularly uh, from her travel to the Southwest. Um, and you'll see more of that in our video ahead. Now here we see Emerald Place. And this was a summer home for Anne um, near Montgomery, her uncle's home there with a lake and this, this is another example of the kind of inspiration she took from nature. Um, we know that her first um, children's book was written and began right there. She had three of them. And uh, before she left Alabama uh, to go to New York City, to discover um, sculpting and art and go to school there, uh, those books would become the, the very source of income for her, if you can imagine uh, a, a young woman uh, making her way in New York City during the Great Depression. So, after completing her schooling at Smith College, where she earned a, a degree in religious studies, in her senior year, she was elected Phi Beta Kappa and graduated magna cum laude in 1927. Um, she would then go on to New York and these children's books, we're just gonna show you the Bucci's Wings, the cover of one. Um, they are such a reflection of those she loved and grew up with. Uh, they're very much her story through the eyes of the children and the wonderful people. Um, there you see the cotton plants. Um, Bucci is a character of a child um, that, that went to heaven. So that's the story. And you have these wonderful characters like Evangelina and Pappy King. And this follows another book um, called Frog. That was her first one. And the publisher of the Dr. Doolittle series at the time wrote the forward to that book. And truly recognized um, Ann Norton's pursuits, Ann Weaver's pursuits um, as an artist and why she was writing these books and why she chose those subjects. They are written in dialect. 
Um, and we have been waiting for a very long time to, to share the story of these books. They've been on display here for a while. And so that is a wonderful part of pioneering her way um, through New York. Uh, I think she, she, Margaret's going to get into some of her awards and other recognitions. Um, we are so proud to display so many of her maquettes in bronze plaster and of course the cedar totems I mentioned um, and to welcome you on this road trip. Margaret. Hi everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. So I'm going to begin Anne's story uh, in 1929 when she arrived in New York, September of 1929. Um, after she was admitted to the National Academy of Design. And she arrived just one month before the um, stock market crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. So I think that sets a good sort of atmosphere um, for what was going on in the country at that time. Uh, she attended classes there for three years, studying under sculptor Charles Keck and cartoonist Carl Thomas Anderson, to name a few. During the summer, she took classes at the Grand Central School of Art from John, George John Lober. And in the spring of 1930, Norton attended the Art Students League of New York studying under Homer Boss. In 1932, she was admitted to Cooper Union and studied sculpture for three and a half years under Charles Rudy. And she won numerous awards in figure modeling and sculpture comp composition. Uh, up next, Anne was awarded two Carnegie Traveling Fellowships while she was in New York. The first one was in 1935 at the urging of her aunt, uh, Clara Weaver Parrish, who was a great influence in her life, as we discussed. This time she went to France to study um, art and architecture at the Center of Romanesque Architecture in Vesely. And we feel that this was really the beginnings of um, her connection between art and architecture. And um, the use of arches and apertures. And I have here just a few um, processes that I'd like you to see where we're sort of making the connection. The first one in the top left was a drawing that Anne had written in a letter to a friend in 1936, uh, right after she had you know, come back from this traveling fellowship. And then we see some watercolors of similar sort of going through the steps that she had. And the far right was another one of her pastel drawings she did with Sanskrit, a maquette she did in mahogany, and then the final product, uh, gateway number four that we have in the gardens now. Um, you can go on to the next slide. And then the next uh, fellowship that she had was in 1940 when she went to Italy where she studied the sculptural elements of cathedrals, palaces and churches, arches, towers, and turrets, and also the systems of support, particularly those of Romanesque and, and early Gothic buildings, all leading the way to the monolithic sculptures that we now have in the gardens. So um, I put these together because I think it's just a really great way for you all to see her process and how long. I mean, a lot of these drawings started in the 40s and the final product of the brick gateways were done in the 60s. I think I have one more slide of, of another demonstration. And this is also watercolor, then mahogany, and then um, finally to her to her brick number five. Uh, so when Anne returned to the States, she was looking for sculptors whose work reflected her developing style. One was John Havanis, who taught at the Art Students League and Cooper Union, and another was Alexander Arkhipenko. In all, Norton spent five years as an apprentice under Arkhipenko and Havanis, among others. In the early 30s in, sculpt in sculpture, the traditional method of starting with a model and then hiring a craftsman to create the sculpture was shifting in some circles to the method of direct carving, mm -hmm. a process by which artists, including Archipenko, use their own chisel and mallet to create their works. Using this process, their sculpture took on a more abstracted, non-literal re literal representation, and Norton greatly admired these sculptors and her drawings at the time show a shift towards more ac abstract and simple lines. Um, at this time, Norton was beginning to have some success in her field, and she was included in a book uh, titled Art in America and Modern Times by Alfred Barr, who was the director of the Museum of Modern Museum of Art published in 1934. She was referenced as one of 20 up and coming women artists doing very good work. And um, it's our understanding this was a term that did not endear Anne. 
as she was most certainly a feminist and objected um, to the fact that it had to be noted that she was a woman artist. However, she was very happy to be in the company of Louise Nevelson, Anne Hyatt Huntington, and Malvina Hoffman, who are also uh, referenced in that book. Um, I wanted to show you too, she had on the next slide, during this time, she exhibited uh, Negro Head, which she had done um, in 1928 in bronze, was shown at MoMA in 1930. Woman and Bird in that she created in 1933, shown at the Seligman Gallery in 1934. And Memorial Monument 1936 she created was shown um, at the Whitney Museum in 1940. So that was really great accomplishments for Anne. However, the commissions just were not forthcoming. And despite her successes, she realized she needed to find alternate means of financial support. So at this point, she applied and was accepted to be the first sculpting instructor at the Norton Gallery and School of Art in West Palm Beach, Florida, starting in early 1943. Uh, once she got to Florida and was able to start making some income, she went back to casting some of her, her modeled work before, including a major series called Casualties, with four bronze sculptures produced between 1944 and 47, and several more created in the late 1940s, portraying everyday subject matter, such as people cutting hair, children pumping water, kneeling figures, and others. Um, this is, you can see here too, the first one is Casualties of War, and those are actually jitterbug dancers and cutting hair on, on the right, all done in bronze. Um, so as Valerie touched on before, through her teaching at the Norton Gallery, she did become acquainted with um, the founder, Ralph, and, um, and he and his first wife, Elizabeth Calhoun, she was very friendly with them. And just to sort of lay the groundwork, um, the Nortons had come to Florida and purchased the home in 1932 here at 253 Barcelona Road. It had originally been con constructed and designed by Maurice Fascio in 1925. And when the Nortons bought it, they hired uh, Mary and Sims Wyeth to make some adjustments to the house. And it was through this relationship with Mary and Sims Wyeth that they ultimately um, hired him to design the Norton Gallery, which would house their expanding collection of art. And as we like to say, um, the story really does begin here because without this home at 253 Barcelona Road, they never would have befriended Marion Sims Wyatt and the Norton Gallery wouldn't have been built um, as it was. And as this, you know, the story goes on and wouldn't have been hired, et cetera. So um, as she settled into her teaching role, she found a friend and worthy adversary and founder of the gallery trading barbs and personal opinions on artist and worthiness of a particular piece or technique. On the subject of direct carving, which we know was so important to Anne, she was particularly vigilant. In archival letters, we learned that she was thrilled when she heard that Norton had purchased a work by Amadeo Modigliani, who believed sculpture should be not be modeled, but direct, directly carved. And in 1946, the Norton Gallery and School of Art is front and center stage in Gallery Magazine, featuring the art of Anne Weaver, Jacques Lipschitz, William Zorak, and Jose de Creft. De Creft, excuse me. Um, so here we have a great photo of Anne and Ralph in the gardens, looking very happy and relaxed. They not only connected on art, they both loved music. And uh, we do have a, one of the rooms, one of the galleries here was the music room where they sat together and, and loved to listen to music and, and Ralph would play the piano. And then on the photo on the right-hand side, after Anne had, had stopped teaching, after the Nortons got married in 1948, she stopped teaching and Jose de Creft actually succeeded her as the sculpting teacher at, at the gallery. And um, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, one thing I know Valerie had touched on this too, this is the, the a photo of draped figure, which is in the permanent collection and always on display at the Norton Museum. And that was at, at the bequest of Mr. Norton that as soon as Anne finished this, that it become a part of the permanent collection. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful piece. We love to go visit and see it. At, um, okay, and then next slide, please. And then this was her last um, series two. This is when her work began to take on more of a cubist look. This is titled Man and Machine. And this was exhibited um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1951. Okay, 
And sadly, uh, after just five years of marriage, Ralph Norton died in December of 1953. And this was a real tra time changing for Anne because this is when she really began to travel. We have a um, photo of here with her in India and then another, another photo of Anne and her mother in Venice, Italy. Um, but what came next was probably the biggest change in her life and what really started to begin the collection of what we have here in, in the gardens for the outdoor works. So in 1954, Anne traveled to Utah and Arizona and began a journey that would change the course of her life. It's hard to say when Anne began conceiving her sculpture entitled Seven Beings for images were found in a sketchbook from the 1930s that reflects some of the aspects of the monument. First drawn on a very small sketchbook, she soon uses plasticine and begins to form the beings first very much just ideas and then a grouping is born. She said the most significant thing about this sculpture was that the inspiration, the derivation is America. She was referring to Bryce Canyon, Monument Valley and the Grand Canyon. After trips to Arizona and Utah, seeing thousands of stone formations standing in ageless majesty and mystery, she began this colossal feat. Anne's initial thoughts were to sculpt seven beings in bronze, but staying true to her friend and mentor, William Zorak, who wholeheartedly believed in the direct carving method and said that as the stone shrinks, the volume expands. Um, so here we have this fabulous picture of early sketches of seven beings. And then down on the right-hand side is Bryce, Bryce Canyon. So you can very clearly see her inspiration there and the drawings and then over in uh, on the left-hand side, we have one of the early maquettes in plaster. Um, at this point, Jean Leofonte, a former Cooper Union student and fellow sculptor enters the picture. Now he's a master of enlargement with a studio in Staten Island and Anne engaged him to work with her on the seven beings. For 10 years, this project moves forward with many setbacks and delays. The entire project is moved to its final resting place in Anne's garden and the final and most intricate work is done by Anne herself climbing scaffolding to reach the faces. She's now 60 years old and the lasting memorial to her husband installed in the garden has become a story told over and over as the world discovers the works. If you could go to the next slide, please. So here are our different drawings. The first one on the left is a sketch that Anne did while she was at Cooper Union. The middle one is Navajo head and the one on the far right is an actual face um, that's on the seven beings currently. And it just, you know, one of the things that we know through, through Anne's story is that so many of these images were in her mind for a really long time, sometimes starting in her childhood um, and, you know, drawings and sketches that she did in her thirties, she actually didn't get to bring to life until the sixties. So she was very determined and persistent with her, with her vision. Next slide, please. And here you go. Here is Anne in her pith hat up on the scaffolding doing her carving. Uh, and then there is Jean Leofonte on, on the right-hand side who was very instrumental in Anne's life and helping her, her bring her, her dreams to reality. Um, one thing that I wanted to say too with um, regard to the seven beings, we have a few quotes. Daniel Catton Rich of the Chicago Institute of Fine Arts wrote after seeing images of Anne's seven beings, the modern movement in sculpture had produced surprisingly few works on a monumental scale and almost none involving a group of related figures. Anne Norton had the vision to create such a sculpture. Charles Sterling, one of the curators at the Louvre at the time applauded this accomplishment and it stands in her garden, her seven stone sentinels with their calm gazes that together define a circle and became a tribute to her late husband, Ralph. So these are really, um, we do re refer to them as the guardians of the gardens and they have a spectacular presence. And no matter where you stand around them, one of them is always looking at you, which is a really protective and, and wonderful feeling when you're here in the gardens. So Seven Beings was the last figurative piece that Anna ever made. From this time on, she moved completely into the world of abstraction. She worked furiously and quietly and produced hundreds of pastel and charcoal sketches, experimenting with geometric shapes and brilliant colors, mostly abstract. From these, she began working in mahogany and carved a series of maquettes. 
Not only were basic shape and design important, but she was also very focused on the surface of her work and carved, leaving intricate details and visible traces of her hands on the wood. Everywhere there were parts of a series. She was drawing in the cottage, painting in a spare bedroom, and waiting for the day when all of this would be translated. Working with Leah Fontre on the concept of limit limitless enlargement and works, works began on a series of monolith, megalith, or simply put, large works for the garden. And here are some of her, uh, her totems that um, most of this, the wood that came for these came from the Pacific Northwest after Anne went there, visited there as well. This is where Francis is sitting in the student now, our studio now, excuse me. Next slide. Okay, in the 1960s, Anne made a series of torsos that began to chip away at the excess information, paring the figure down to the fundamental information and becoming more abstract. The far right um, abstract figure torso on the next slide was actually featured in the exhibition um, in the Musée Rodin in France. So you can see she definitely had, um, once again, a passion for the torso. Okay, and then she turned to her last new material, brick. Using a rare pink Mexican brick, she created a giant sculpture, 47 feet long, creating an abstraction reminiscent of a mountain range or sea creature. Later, she created seven vertical monolithic sculptures called gateways. They were made of red handmade North Carolina brick, 20 feet high, created for her garden, well-placed to appear suddenly behind dense foliage. So this is a plaster maquette, and here's a mahogany of, of gateway number two. During this period, Norton kept working on her two-acre site, taking down trees and planting na na uh, native trees. In early 1977, she was diagnosed with leukemia, which led her to focus more fully on the future. She wished to create a foundation to ensure the preservation of her property for the community's benefit a garden museum, a mix of sculpture with trees, bushes, water, and wildflowers, as well as space for exhibitions and symposiums. The concept was further enriched by Sir Peter Smithers, a distinguished British politician and garden designer who Anne had met. She invited him to her gardens and asked him to redesign them. He developed an overall plan that incorporated a number of rare palms, creating a dense landscape that would provide the hide and reveal concept that Anne had envisioned. In 1978, while increasingly ill and frail, Anne received her first public commission from the Cambridge Arts Council and Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority to create a sculpture for the plaza in front of the new Harvard Square subway in Cambridge, Mass. Her design gateway to knowledge is a 20 foot high brick truncated obelisk with a narrow slit from its base almost to the top. The two pillars represent knowledge and education, and the six inch wide slot separating them suggests that the passageway to knowledge is narrow indeed. One leg of the brick sculpture is slightly in front of the other, giving the massive piece the appearance of mobility. In a joint statement from the two organizations that commissioned her work, Mrs. Norton's work will offer a smoothing, excuse me, soothing visual focus for a restless urban nexus with the works brick complementing the materials used in most of the area's surrounding buildings. So in the center, um, you can see the actual gateway to knowledge, uh, the black and white. And then on the far right, right hand side, Anne's friend Gia Leofonte constructed um, a replica of gateway to knowledge that we have here um, in the gardens that we love very much posthumously after, after Anne passed away to honor her. And next slide, please. In 1981, she won an artist grant from the National Endowment for the Arts for an untitled sculpture, Monument 8. It appears to be influenced by her trips to India where she sketched temple columns of similar construction. The sculpture was unfinished at the time of her death and using Anne's drawings and elaborate design she had submitted with her application, Jane Leofonte with friends from an anonymous donor finished one of her beings as she referred to it. After that, um, in 1982, Anne passed away and is buried back in uh, at Live Oak Cemetery in Selma, Alabama. Beautiful job, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. We've got two videos. We really enjoy sharing with you to give you an overview of Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens and what you will see if you come to visit us here. And then a season recap that really demonstrates 
the way we welcome visitors and students and enjoy world-class visiting exhibitions, uh, artists and musicians. So we've got two. First is the overview of the property. And the second is our season just post COVID that was so successful this year. I'm so sorry. Um, I just wanted, I know we're kind of running short on time and there's so much incredible programming to um, celebrate here. We have, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left of our presentation today. So I wanted to make sure we had time for some Q&A. Francis, is, is it okay if we move forward on that? Sure. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Margaret and Francis, um, for such an incredible introduction to Anne, her space and her practice. Um, I saw that there were quite a few questions coming in through the Q&A, so I wanted to make sure we attended to those. Um, so to 
start out. Um, so we know the garden is open to the public as we can see from some of that incredible programming you've done over the last year, um, and I'm sure for many years. Uh, but we have someone who's wanting to know what year did the gardens and studios open to the public? It was 1982 when Ann Norton died and it was established as a private foundation at that point. Um, so it's been 45 years now um, open to the public and our uh, board underwent a renaissance about six years ago. Um, so it, it became uh, officially a 501c3 operating as a really vibrant cultural organization within our community. Fabulous. And is it open year round? It is in an unusual year. It's going to be closed um, beginning in June until November. It will reopen with um, a, a very celebratory ribbon cutting uh, following the completion of the restoration of the Norton House. That's awesome, incredible. Thank you. Um, so um, I have someone who's wondering how Ann Norton's works were received initially by art critics. Um, did she have a lot of commissions or sell um, during her lifetime? Uh, these are, they are saying that's your great works um, and they're new to Ann Norton. So what, uh, how was her work received by art critics during her lifetime? Margaret, you wanna take that? Sure. Sure. So she did. Uh, she did do well. She had, um, you know, obviously with her public commission in in Cambridge, and she had also had another commission for a sculpture of Saint Francis that is still in a garden in Vermont. We just uh, received some photos from the owner uh, that came out of our article in Preservation Magazine, and. Um, she had some success around here too, but you know, I think like it was not a great time. It was the Great Depression, and uh, sculpture is very expensive, very expensive to to cast and produce. So, did she was she highly su successful in her sales? I, I would say she had some success, but not enough to keep her going, which is why she which is why she wanted to teach. Yeah, thank you. Um, so. I have another question about, uh, which is great because I've, I've been wondering this as well about the residency program that is on site. The James Castle House also has an artist in residency program. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to um, how artists engage with your site or engage with your visitors. Well, we're, we're honored to be in our second year of the Artist in Residence program. It began before COVID um, with sculptor Steve Hash. And uh, this year we welcomed Bradley Theodore. He uh, is known internationally and um, shown his work all over the world. Uh, he's, he, and uh, our goal with this program is exactly what is happening on site where these artists are directly engaged with visitors in the community and especially with students and a very special program that we have in particular called Art, Music and Healthy Hearts. So they are actually engaging with these artists in the dramatic setting of the gardens, but mm. also getting their own masterpieces firsthand with that artist right here in the studio. Wow, that is incredible. What a really special experience, especially for students who are maybe looking to pursue art um, down the road. That's amazing. Um, let's see, any other kind of questions in here? Oh, uh, yes. So uh, where can Anne's work be seen beside uh, the gardens in West Palm Beach? She ha oh, go ahead, Francis. Um, we we love that uh, we were able to create an exhibition uh, two years ago with the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County. Uh, so that's the first time that Anne's work has traveled um, in about ten years. There was a beautiful exhibition created uh, in partnership with the University of Alabama shown on campus in Tuscaloosa. 
uh, 10 years ago. And um, of course the piece you saw um, that is featured permanently at the Norton Museum of Art. Yes, wonderful. So there, so the best place probably to see her work is coming to visit, but it is elsewhere in the world is what it sounds like. Incredible. Well, um, I think that's all the questions we have. And I know we're kind of bumping up against um, kind of, oh, one more question just came in. Um, are her children's books still in print? It's a great question. No, no. no. Gotcha. Um, are there copies that are part of your collection? Yes, yes. We, have, we have a copy of all of them, but they're, they're very hard to find. Gotcha. Great, well, great question. Good to know that they're, mm -hmm. they're out there somewhere perhaps, but uh, not, not at your local Barnes and Nobles. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I am gonna close us out um, here. So I wanna thank uh, all of our attendees today for, for joining us. Um, and of course, thank you, Francis. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Valerie and Lavona. Um, for, for being here and for sharing about this really incredible space and this um, and amazing artist. Uh, Ann Norton was new to me as well um, before this program and she's quickly rising through the ranks of, of some of my favorites. So uh, thank you so much. Um, I also wanna give a quick thank you to the staff at the James Castle House who have helped bring this program to life. Um, Valerie, once again, for so fearlessly committing to this program and Margaret and Francis for yeah, offering this really intimate view into, into her world, into her, um, into her practice. Uh, so for those of you that are anxious to start your own road trip, um, I would highly recommend checking out the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Guidebook, um, which is available online at many retailers, um, including uh, the jamescastlehouse.org. I'm not sure, Margaret, are you also um, selling it at your retail yes. space? Yes. Awesome. Absolutely. Wonderful. It is, it is well worth having um, in, on your shelf and in your car for future road trips, I would, I would definitely say. Um, so this is a highly visual guidebook um, that has, uh, you know, stunning images and artist and site stories all grouped by U.S. regions. So it's impossible to uh, drive by any of these sites if you're out on the road this summer. Um, as I mentioned, a recording of today's event will be made available online in the coming weeks, and you can find this and other recordings uh, on the James Castle House YouTube channel. I want to pop some links into the chat for um, the YouTube channel, upcoming events, um, and contact information for, for all of us um, in case you have further questions or want to know. And Valerie, um, can you share real briefly um, an additional event happening in the Haas universe um, for those that might be interested? Yes, so tomorrow, thank you, Mackenzie. So tomorrow at um, 3 p.m. Eastern time, we will conduct our series Home Improvement, which is in collaboration with the Florence Griswold Museum um, in Old Lyme, Connecticut. This is virtual live stream, one hour online, which unlike here, which is an immersion into one site on the road trip and, and really trying to channel um, the experiential quality of going to these places where artists were inspired and did their life work practice. Home Improvement is a, a short case studies around the innovative work happening at sites, sort of uh, behind the scenes peek at the work that goes on to make all of these sites actually function and the um, sort of uh, questions and challenges that we tackle and the ways, different ways in which we do that. And, Tomorrow will feature reinterpretive plans happening at the Winslow Homer Studio in Maine and the Wharton Escherich in um, Malvern, Pennsylvania. And you can find links to attend that both on the Florence Griswold site, artisthomes.org, and I believe that Mackenzie might have put it in the chat. Um, so we would welcome um, anyone interested to come join us again tomorrow. And of course, next month, we travel to Georgia and Passaquan, one of the new sites to have just been accepted into Haas um, only um, a little, I think, over a month ago. So stay tuned. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, we're so excited to continue this road trip. So uh, we hope you will join us then. Um, and with that, I think we will say good afternoon, good evening, um, and we'll see all of you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.